Let's start. Um, so welcome everyone, great to see you. I'm Dr. Susan Pollack, I'm one of the co-founders of this wonderful Center of Mindfulness and Compassion. And I'd like to introduce today Thomas Hubel, who's a renowned teacher, author, and international facilitator whose lifelong work integrates the core insights of the great wisdom traditions with the discoveries of science. Since the early 2000s, he's been leading large scale events and courses that focus on the healing and integration of trauma <coughs> with a special focus on the shared history of Israelis and Germans. Over the last decade, he's facilitated dialogue with tens of thousands of people around healing the collective traumas of racism, oppression, colonialism, genocides in the US, Israel, Germany, Spain, and Argentina. Thomas, who's currently based in Tel Aviv, Israel, worked as paramedic in his early years and attended several years of medical school in Vienna, Austria, before embarking on his current path. He is the founder of the Academy of Inner Science, which offers a master's and doctorate program in collaboration with US and German universities. And he's been presenting trainings for Harvard staff and faculty since 2019. His nonprofit organization, The Pocket Project, works to support the healing of collective trauma throughout the world. He's the author of the book, Healing Collective Trauma, a process for integrating our intergenerational and cultural wounds. Thomas, welcome. It's a delight to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. That's so generous of you. And thank you for having me at the Center of Mindfulness and Compassion. We talked briefly before that um, how much we are along the lines and how important this work is and how important it is to bring mindfulness and awareness and presence into healthcare and client interactions and process facilitation. So I'm very much, I'm very happy to be here today. And, um, and that we became allies in the past, that's beautiful. Yeah, good afternoon, uh, everybody. I think good afternoon or good evening. For me, it's already evening here. Um, yes, today I want to speak to something that became my passion um, in the last 20 years after I discovered, I think it's 18, 19, 20 years ago, I don't remember correctly, but that my first collective trauma processes showed up in, in, in my groups and um, and at first it was pretty intense and surprising, like what, what happened in the groups that 40, 50 people at once went through like some kind of trauma release or experience. And it happened spontaneously in the groups. And then uh, the groups were mainly in the German speaking area, mainly in Germany, Austria. And and then I got to understand something fundamental about trauma, since trauma often being seen as a personal biographic um, event or events in our lives or attachment trauma. But through the groups, I came to understand, wow, we are living in, in, a, in a world that has been traumatized for thousands and thousands of years. And I have been born into a traumatized and fragmented world. But me growing up as a boy in post-World War II Austria, nobody really told me that, um, that many things and many symptoms I saw in my parents, in my teachers, in the society around me were actually trauma symptoms. And um, so I have been conditioned my nervous system has been conditioned by a world that is expressing partly healthy integrated structures of life, consciousness, society, presence, and, and it's partly based on absence. 
And I love to call the signature, so absence is the signature of trauma. And I would love to um, explore today with you in this kind of uh, meeting, the nature of absence, because I think it's so important in our daily interactions and how we, we are looking and exploring together through mindfulness, through relation, through resilient community building, that which we can't perceive because we can't feel, because we are numb and absent. And, and that exactly what we are looking for is very hard to touch. And so I want to explore a little bit presence and absence. And maybe I have two slides that I would love to show. Maybe, Laurie, could you, uh, the presence, right. So we often talk about presence. And I think Ben Siegel, um, somebody that, I, that works at UCLA, um, that I very much appreciate, uh, writes about presence and writes about the uh, uh, interpersonal neurobiology. So how something that I love to work with when we explore relational intelligence is that when we are being receptively aware, compassionate and kind at our core, we express presence. And presence is connected to sensing. And sensing is connected to feeling and sensing means these are the aware parts where my nervous system is resourced, is open and is related. Where I'm able to practice interoception, my, an awareness process of my inner world, and at the same time, neuroception, an awareness, like a relational awareness of you. So combining my inner world perception and my outer world perception into one experience is presence. And being able to witness whatever is the information that arises in me moment to moment to moment. And I think many contemplative traditions are practicing um, that kind of awareness state, which means information plus awareness is presence, conscious awareness. Whereas when we look at uh, absence for a moment, um, absencing is is a very intelligent process. It looks often as if that's our main issue or main problem, but in fact, it's, it's the, the number one process that helped us in overwhelming moments. It means that my nervous system has the capacity when I'm really stressed and I'm hyperactivated to fragment and shut down the part that is deeply overwhelmed in order to survive better. And some of us know that from, from very strong experiences, one-time experiences, some of us know that through like an, an attachment process where we often felt overwhelmed or overloaded by the fear, the stress that we experience. And so absencing, as Otto Schama also puts it, at, uh, uh, who works at the MIT, um, is closing our minds, closing our hearts, which means I start living in my own separate bubble and closing down part of my will. And um, Steve Porges, um, in the polyvagal theory, Describe, describes the, sta the stages basically of the escalation of stress in our nervous system until the freeze state. And I want to explore that freeze state because in my understanding, the deepest pain in our world is often mute. The deepest pain in our world has no voice. And, and when we look at our own deep pain, we will discover our own pain through breaking our own absence 
And we will discover the collective deep pain through tracking and tracing a collective absencing. And another very important aspect that I've come to learn through thousands and thousands of client interactions and group sessions, how absencing, it's not absence, it's actually absencing is an activity. So we don't have numbness, we learn to numb ourselves ever since. And I think that's very important because numbing is a process. Can we, can I just come back, Lori? Um, it's numbness is like when I ask you, okay, what's your fridge doing right now? Or your freezer? What's your freezer doing right now? Most probably your freezer is freezing your food. So trauma is not something that happens. In, in my understanding of the process work with trauma is that we, we connect to an ongoing freezing a process that needs electricity. And, and the electricity bill is what we pay for every month. And so that means part of my life energy is part of my aliveness is bound in freezing, in absencing. So these are, these are active processes, not passive experiences. But in my, in my daily experience, it might come up in my life as, oh, I feel numb. Today, I got a CNN push notification and I, uh, and I looked at my phone and I said, I read, there are more than 50 mass shootings that happened in the US since the middle of March. You got the message too, or you read that too. And then I sat and I looked at, okay, what's happening in me, getting this information, and in, the interesting word of info, like information is an interesting word. It's in, it's, it's in formation. When I receive Susan or Lori, the information that lands in me is an embodied experience that I, that I feel, I can feel people that I meet through my body, through my emotions. I can co-think and understand their mental or cognitive information. I have a relational awareness, maybe a spiritual awareness. And, and so information creates a formation in me in order to host the external world in me. Which means the language of relation is resonance. When we relate to each other, we are resonating with each other. And then sensing and feeling and thinking become one unit. But often when we, when we think about life, the sensing and feeling and the thinking might be split. Because I grew up in a world that was partly at least split where the, the mental, the emotional and the physical experience of moment-to-moment -moment awareness is not synchronized, is not coherent, is fragmented. And so when, when I read the, the news feed, I looked at, okay, am I, what's happening in me when I read about 50 mass shootings? Is this something that really can inform me? Or, Am I a cognitive witness, a mental witness, so I can understand what I read, but my emotional and my physical experience can't process that information. And so mindfulness or process mindfulness, as I understand it, especially also in the trauma work, is me becoming aware of where my sensing and thinking together ends. 
where I'm, for example, not anymore a contemporary witness of the societal process around me. So I, as a citizen, have a limited capacity to process the complexity of what's happening around me. And I think it's not that I shouldn't, that I should be able to process that, but I think it's very important to be able to notice where is the limit. So that I, that I become aware of where my own numbness or my own incapacity to process an event starts. And so that's just an example that I will come back to later when we talk about how media, especially sensational media is, is, is touching constantly the hyperactivated or numb part of, of our collective experience and, and what's actually trauma sensitive journalism or mindful journalism that creates information that creates understanding. Because if we, if we reinforce the fragmentation, we don't create understanding. And that keeps the trauma, um, the recurrent trauma loops, I believe, going, like an, a reenactment or repetitive cycles. But for now, I want to look at, um, when we bring it for a moment back to a, a personal dimension before we continue with collective trauma. So I would love to go through a short practice with you. Again, that we don't have just theory, we also have some practice here in this hour together. And I would love to take you into a short mindfulness practice first within yourself and then with us here as a group. And let's start for a moment with what I said before. So self-regulation starts with my awareness of my physical, mental, and emotional state. And so if I, because we're also coming from different several activities into this space here. And now if you take a moment and I, I stay with a few cycles of my breathing, and every time I exhale, I prolong my exhalation a bit. Exhale, I prolong my exhalation. And with my exhalation, I drop a bit deeper into my body. Another cycle. And I exhale, drop a bit deeper into my body. I just notice the way I'm sitting right now. And so take a few moments just to listen to where is most of your aliveness in the body right now. Where is most beaming, pulsing, vital sensations, aliveness, or felt presence, the areas of your body that you feel well and you feel at home. Presence has a lot to do with feeling at home in oneself. Able to feel through the body and feel the body. There is the, the intensity in the body that is alive and present. 
Then you might find areas where you feel more tense or tight, and where you locate areas of stress in the body. There's an intensity of presence and aliveness, and then there's an intensity maybe around tension patterns. Then to switch for a moment in and check in with your emotional experience, what's your emotional experience right now? Emotional experience open, is there a flavor, an emotional flavor you can name? Or does it feel a bit more turned off? Excellent. And from the emotional field to feel for a moment your mind and your thinking, or the steadiness of the mind, or the calmness, tension, sometimes our thinking is tense, our thinking is expanded and inspired, wide open. And then look, what's the place in you that's aware of all those perceptions? Place in you that is aware that you feel your body. It's aware that you're in emotions, your mind, your thinking. The awareness is that. And then you want to slowly open your eyes and see to open your eyes without disconnecting from that inner sensing. And then extend that inner sensing a little bit us here on your screen. And now we we bring that mindfulness or mindful presence and sensing into the relation with others. And if you take a moment just to look at the screen and just focus on a few people. What happens if I bring my from introception, from internal contemplative awareness, I bring it into the relational awareness. We know that our basic attachment learning happens through I feel you feeling me. I feel you and I feel how you feel me. The power of co-regulation is in I feel you feeling me. So when somebody is very stressed or when our children are afraid or stressed, 
And I say, yes, I feel that you are scared. Come to me. We will have a look together. I practice emotional resonance. I practice relational mindfulness and then rational leadership together. I feel that you are scared. I feel that you are stressed. And I, and I invite you into, I feel you feeling me. And I create safety. So that's a very good skill for parents, but it's a very good skill for every healthcare practitioner. It's a very good skill for every everyone in leadership positions or also just in our friendship. But I feel you feeling me. And we will see that in the cultural framework in daily life, absence happens within or they disrupted, I feel you feeling me. Because if I feel absent in myself, I can't feel you. So on the one hand, what we are looking for are the invisible absences here between us. Collective trauma sits here between us. And the superpower to, in a way, meet it and integrate collective trauma sits also here with us. One is mindfulness of presence. One is relational awareness and relating. And one is resilient community building. These are all the human superpowers to meet collective trauma. Because it's so often in the relational dimension, so there might be numbness and absence in me sometimes, and my own awareness process is to practice and to integrate, because practice and integration work, I believe, need to go hand in hand. Because I can practice, and my practice will show me my own absences and my own trauma wounds, and then I need integration. Same is true for relational uh, work and for relational competence building. It means that sometimes I speak to people and I see while I speak to you that in you, you're already a bit absent or distant. And if I keep on talking, I just create more stress. I need to take a moment to breathe, to give space. It's like a computer, when like numbness and dissociation are the emergency brakes to not get more overloaded. So when I feel numb or I, I meet somebody that feels stressed or numb, then adding more stress or more speed is not helpful. I need to actually create more space and slow down a bit and offer co-regulation to feel the overload together, to be mutually aware of numbness. And I think it's so easy to fill the relational moments in our daily life where we are absent or numb with behavior or compensations, with doing, with overdoing. So numbness is always an unconscious invitation to do more and to be less, less being, more doing. And so the skill to recognize like trauma and collective trauma, I believe is also in the mindful application of relational awareness and the detection of the moments where either I myself or you or we both kind of stop feeling and sensing. And then the rational mind becomes actually like a top-down control system that, that protects the overwhelmed part. And I think as communities, we, we don't need to, the specialists that are trauma specialists or the, the therapists, the trauma-informed therapists that work on this on a, from a specialist point of view, but there's a collective competence building where, where we as a society become more aware of simple trauma symptoms that we meet 
every day, which is hyperactivation, a lot of stress, or numbness, muteness, absence. And, and then on the collective level, I believe the since I think there is a myth that there is an individual unconscious is partly a myth because the individual unconscious needs an unconscious society around it to be reinforced. So individual and collective, the individual and the collective unconscious are kind of co-investors in the same absence. Or with other words, our individual absence together creates collective absence. And I think in that collective absence, many things get reenacted that we see in our societies as painful symptoms of the places where we as society and we as individuals of the society are not present. And so when I, when I worked on, on the many groups and workshops where we often brought people from Germany or also descendants of Nazi Germany and those Holocaust survivors together into the same room, we could feel the deep absence and trauma and loss of a tremendous catastrophe of humanity. And at the same time, the capacity to create group presence, like what we did before, that there's individual coherence, and we together as a group create collective coherence, was a tremendous healing force to step by step integrate some of, of that painful past. And I often describe um, collective trauma, let's say you have a, like a TV on the wall and you see a war scene. And it's so loud that at one point you take the remote control and you switch off the sound. And then you still see the, the war scene, but without sound, kind of a bit less real. And then you take the TV and you throw it into the ocean. And then you see how the TV with the war scene still playing, it slowly drops into the water deeper and deeper until it disappears in the dark. And, and when it disappears in the dark, it slowly sinks down to the bottom of the ocean. And there are millions or billions of TVs that are still playing. And I believe that kind of dark space, that absence, is what we experience in our world is distance in time and space. Either it's distant in space, which means we call it the past, or it's distant in, in space, uh, distance in time or distant in space, which means we feel less intimate with the world, with one another, or especially in between groups, ethnicities, and the diversity of our culture, that the fractures between us feel like distance or othering. And, and so I believe it's in, in, in the work that we are doing, we are calling this the I-tip, the A-tip, and the C-tip. I wrote in my book, Healing Collective Trauma, about the C-tip process, this collective trauma integration processes. But at the same time, we are doing a lot of individual trauma integration work and ancestral trauma integration work. So it's, it's kind of a whole, a whole system of integration work. And um, so how we as... Um, as individuals, I believe trauma is, in a way, our responsibility. And, and the English word responsibility is lovely because it's, in a way, the ability to respond. Responsibility is the ability to respond to my life circumstances. 
and where I'm traumatized or where, where we are collectively traumatized, we lack the ability to respond and we are much more in reactivity, which is in reactment of the past than responsibility, like responding out of presence to the current life situation. And that's why I love the, the invitation to the center of mindfulness, because I believe in, in bringing more presence and awareness into the way we relate, we actually already have two superpowers of uh, humanity at the same place, which means presence building tools and relation building capacities. And I think if we add commu resilient community building, like the power of we spaces to the mix, then we have a very powerful mix of tools and practices, training possibilities and integration work that help us to take care of the legacy that we have been born into. And I think it's very, it's very interesting to think about that, you know, when the time when humanity for the first time saw the planet, like there's this overview effect that we became aware of the system that we are part of. And it created a, a, a very important jump, I think, in our awareness. And, but in fact, also the, the one that took that photo wasn't outside of collective trauma. Carried some trauma inside. And it's very interesting that no one was ever outside of collective trauma. So how do we have a kind of an overview effect or a subject object transcendence of that very legacy that is thousands and thousands of years old. I think that's very interesting. I often describe collective trauma as imagine you you were living in an apartment your entire life, and suddenly somebody visits you and say, Hey, by the way. How does the house look like that your apartment's in? And you say, I don't know, never been outside. So we all have been born into a more or less traumatized world. And it's different, maybe for me being, I was born in Austria. It's different for somebody who was born in the US or in any other part of the world. The, hundreds of thousands of years of hundreds or thousands of years of trauma conditioned us. And we are looking through it as we relate to each other. It's very important. So my perception is filtered by the legacy of our past and our ancestors. And so that's why sometimes we might say, that that's how the world is. And that we see, see processes and structures in our society where we say, okay, that's how the world is. And I would say, no, part of what we see is not how the world is, that's how the world is when it's hurt. And I think it's very important to identify the structures of our society that are that we all build together, that are built on pain and on frozenness, because trauma is permafrost. Trauma doesn't want to change because it's scared to change. It's, it's, it's based on freezing. And when we want to address climate change or any other burning social or global issue, we will bump against the permafrost of our culture. And, and I think activism, let's, when we look at, at climate change, activism is great to bring more education, to bring more um, motivation, energy to change habits. 
but it's simply not designed to deal with collective trauma. And when we create a push, when we push trauma to change, we get the backlash of resistance. But it's an unskillful intervention in the societal field. So it's interesting how to create like a more trauma sensitive activism or how maybe to distribute the, um, the skills and, and the different um, functions that are needed to, to induce societal change and to speed up the developmental process of our societies to meet, for example, the climate change requirements that we need at the moment with addressing both the habits, but being mindful of the permafrost. Because otherwise it will be the resistance, it will be the sand in the engine of change. And I think that's something that is very, uh, very powerful. And the other, the other, and then maybe we can also transition to some Q and A's, I'm sure maybe there are some deep questions here. And um, I want to say one more thing about the healthcare field. It, I think the societal awareness that our healthcare field is the firewall or the buffer in the society to get a lot of collective trauma waves uh, that are being kind of concentrated within our healthcare field. So many people that work in the healthcare field are the firewall in the society to get a lot of pain, a lot of trauma, and a lot of emergency as, as the daily workload. And I think to be mindful of that fact that, that collective trauma might blind us to how much more resources we need in the very system that is, that is supposed to heal that. And the, and, the, and the distribution of resources that is not mindful of the immune system of the society might be a collective trauma consequence so that our healthcare system is underfunded and that the money is somewhere else might look like, oh, that's how the world is. And I would say, no, that's not how the world is. That's how, how it looks like when some of the resources in our society simply flow in riverbeds because others are iced over. And so the, the contemplation of um, what actually a sustainable healthcare environment needs in order for everybody who works in it is being prepared and supported to also take the constant trauma impulse that is coming from society into the healthcare field, I think is an interesting systemic question that um, needs the collective trauma uh, knowledge as, as one part of the discussion point in order to discuss that properly because otherwise we might struggle with the permafrost without knowing that that's so. And then, and then it, it's on the expense of many people that work in the healthcare field. And their numbness and like the, the power of relation and like the relational awareness that creates so much joy and resilience when it's cut it creates exactly the opposite. It, it becomes draining, it becomes draining, it becomes um, uh, depleting, and it actually lowers the resilience of individuals and the collective. So I think that's why the exploration of numbness, even if it seems like it's something that's being recognized only when we really look for it, is such an important uh, question and the training of relational capacities to turn numbness into sensing and feeling and embodiment, more embodiment, more awareness of our bodies is simply crucial because numbness happens usually through our bodies. So yeah, 
So that's a short overview, like the individual participation in collective trauma, how it lives in us, how it lives in, in our relations and how it lives in our community, the depth and feel. And I'm sure we could, I could go on for a long time, but these are just a few inspirational points for today. And maybe we can continue with some dialogue or some questions or statements and explore a little bit more together. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Thomas. And thank you for all your insights on how to uh, transform trauma. And thanks for some fascinating metaphors on permafrost and how we all get frozen. So um, before we launch into questions, I just want to let everyone know that the recording and the slides will be sent out later. And also just a reminder of up an upcoming event on May 3rd, we'll be having Lisa Feldman Barrett speaking to us. So what we usually do in terms of questions here is we ask you to raise the blue hand and um, we'll take your question. So again, thank you, Thomas. And we look forward to hearing your thoughts now. Thank you. Okay, great. We have two blue hands. Judy, would would you like to start, please? Um, sure. Um, as somebody who was raised in post-war England rather than Austria, um, I noticed that um, really the the keep calm and carry on attitude was very prevalent, and I'm wondering. Um, as we continue to be bombed by the IRA in the 60s and 70s, I don't remember being desperately afraid. Um, and I, I wonder whether that was, um, you know, intergenerational trauma acting uh, in my defense, or whether it would be more um, accounted for by the fact I was in my teenage years and consequently invincible anyway. Um, but I've always wondered about that. Um, you know, how much was one thing, how much was the other? Yeah, I love in, in this sense, I always love to listen to what the body tells us about it. And so when we, when we look inside and we, we have some questions come up and then to check in with how, how your body responds to, to the questions, because when we, um, I believe when we see the after effects of trauma, we will notice that in when we think about certain things or when we think about certain events in our life, we can, we can feel either that we are pretty present and connected in our body when we talk about it, or we feel a little absent. And I think that when, if there is some uh, kind of intergenerational or, or personal trauma in us, then we feel when we pay attention while we speak to the sense that we have of our body, it can give us an indication if I feel pretty grounded and in myself, or if I feel that there is either a little bit of nervousness, a little bit of fear, a little bit of stress, or the absence of my body. And and when so that's that's I think a tool that I'm I'm sharing with you, but I'm sharing with all of us that what's what the the way back through our body and and noticing the subtle changes that happen in me when I talk about certain things in my life. And then it gives me like a tracking tool that I can use for many situations in my life. And, and I think that's also good to look because if you feel that some parts of you or your body turn a bit absent 
when you speak about it, it's harder to feel. Then I think it's a sign that there is there's more um, absence that covers maybe fear. And then that, that would be an interesting place to explore and, and go deeper with. Because then, then it's a sign that the fear has been already switched off. And that's why um, it, it wasn't that strong at that time. And so my hunch would be that, there, that, that's a good, that that's a good way to trace it as a, as a practice. Thank you. Great, thank you. And Catherine, I believe you were next in line. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> well, I, I think I have a question in here. <laughs> I have a, a few thoughts. Um, uh, so I work in healthcare and have for the last 25 years. Um, I'm a clinical social worker working in a medical setting. And your um, comments about um, absencing uh, both collectively and individually in the healthcare system really rings so true. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm not sure I would have used that language. So I really like the language. Um, uh, even before the pandemic, um, as a, a fairly new teacher of MBSR, so I've been practicing mindfulness about five years. Mm -hmm. As I was doing that, really just more clearly seeing this absencing in healthcare and what's happening around me with um, myself and others um, and how it permeates the care that we give um, in such a damaging way. Um, so I think the pandemic situation and what healthcare providers have endured um, has probably certainly made this much, much worse. And um, as someone who, you know, I'm being invited to uh, do a workshop in next fall to um, a group of healthcare providers and just thinking about um, the many things I could share and speak to, um, of course, mindfulness being one of them. Um, I'm just thinking about, um, you know, many healthcare providers are interested in mindfulness, but they think their their focus when they hear that is around their thinking. You know, right? Uh, oh yeah, my mind is scattered, and um, I need to settle. Um, they don't. I don't think the general impression when when people unfamiliar with mindfulness hear that think of embodiment, and um, even myself, kind of really learning in the last couple of years, like, oh, this is about being in my body. <laughs> um, so I guess my question is a, is a, is a little bit of um, maybe in the simplest way, how to bring more of the embodiment uh, if you're bringing something to healthcare providers and then maybe in a, in a, in a bigger question, you know, how do we begin to bring this to the healthcare system? That's a big question. Yeah, that's a big question, right. <laughs> and um, yeah, maybe two things, one is, I think in, even in the, in the meditation practice, when we focus on the mind and the mind seems scattered, the mind is just uh, the windmills of our stress. So like the thoughts that are running are fueled by the uprising stress energy that we carry in ourselves. So by calming down and down regulating our nervous system we are also down you know down regulating the activity of our mental system so that's why when people come and and see mindfulness about the mind eventually every practitioner will come to the same conclusion like you after some time that the real uh, down regulation of my thought process is through my body but then we all hit the same barrier that it had a good, we all had a very good reason to turn off every little bit of our nervous system and embodiment because it was simply too painful. And I think this needs to be said over and over again that numbing is an intelligent process. 
and the stress, the chronic stress that I can't feel anymore. And if I can feel stress, I can't downregulate it. So it becomes chronic stress. There's so much chronic attachment stress in so many people. And only when we turn on the light again, which means an, an embodied awareness of the stress, we can downregulate that stress. And then we see something. Then my thinking and my feeling and sensing become one coherent function. I often say in my group facilitation trainings, when we tr train facilitation, I often say, when I see in my mind only one thought arise about the group, I know that I lost the relation. When I start thinking, okay, what's the next step for this group? I know that I'm not anymore fully in tune with the group because I start thinking about it. My sensing and my thinking are not anymore fully coherent. So it means that I meet a place in myself where I don't fully feel the process anymore. Otherwise, my thinking is a natural consequence of the, the sensing. So sensing and thinking is one. And then my inner system, my nervous system is regulated. And so, and I think that's especially when you, when you work in, a, in the healthcare system where you are exposed to a lot of trauma and to, to a lot of suffering and a lot of pain, you need to balance that every day. You need to relate to pain, trauma, stress, uh, loss, many qualities that you as a human being need to handle somehow. And that's why, because when we turn on the numbness into feeling again, we also start to feel much more. And that working in the healthcare field is challenging, not only in the healthcare field for everybody, but I think especially when we are exposed to a lot of trauma and pain to our work, we need the maturity. The only way to do it is through uh, mature relation. Because when when I look at you, you happen in my nervous system. The perception of you that I see is in my central nervous system. And then we talk about professional distance or professional relation. But professional relation happens in me because every patient or every client is already happening in me. So how do I regulate the felt experience of my clients or, or patients in a state and stress state and, and pain, because it's already happening in me. The only way is either to numb myself or to be in a, in a very mature, developed relational capacity so that I'm, I'm relation becomes the competence of handling that stress. And I think that's why when it's challenging, when we open the numbness, we actually need to integrate a lot of our own developmental process in order to get there. So integration and practice are the key elements to be able to turn numbness into, into um, development. And I think that's, that's what, what we have to focus on, that that becomes the standard of supporting um, our healthcare. Yeah, well, thank you so much. And sorry, we don't have no any more time. We try to end promptly since we're uh, good clinicians here, but we've learned a lot from you and I look forward and we look forward to continuing um, the dialogue of um, how to work relationally in a way that makes sense in healthcare mm. and in our practices. So thank, thank you. you for having me. Thank you. Oh, it's a pleasure. And, to be continued and thank you all for coming really mm -hmm. really appreciate it good to mm -hmm. see so many of you